everyone. This is another episode of Conversations with Rob. Please like, subscribe, and also share these videos. They're with amazing people that are doing amazing things in our community and also all around the world. And if you listen to us on the radio also, thank you for that. We have a special guest on, and this is somebody that's running for District 22, Congressional District 22, I should say, in the state of Florida. It's Boca Del Rey, and also, I believe, some of Broward County. She can correct me if I'm wrong on this. But this is Jessie Melton, and she's got quite a like story, and she's going to speak on that. Jessie, thanks so much for coming on. Greatly appreciate the time. Thank you for having me, Rob. I'm happy to be here. All right. Thank you for that. And Jesse, can you tell the viewers a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, well, I am a mom. I have a 10-year-old son. I am also a small business owner. I own a wireless infrastructure development firm. So my company uh, did most of the indoor build out for the Super Bowl in Miami and also in Tampa. Um, <clears throat> so my customers are companies like Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, and large tower companies. And, um, you know, I've been a long time business and politically very passionate, you know, uh, both of those things have to do with the well-being of our people and our nation and our future. And so um, now I'm running for office because, you know, we're kind of in a climate where um, we've just got career politicians that are protecting their little piece of power and uh, protecting their gravy trains and their donor gravy trains. And it's really negatively impacting the American people. It's kind of the nature of the beast. So it's time for American people who have real life experiences, who pay taxes, who have run businesses, served in the military, served in any, you know, any uh, private sector to go in and, and bring fresh views, fresh vantage point, and be able to, to speak on behalf of the American people. So that's, you know, where I'm at now. Now I'm running for office. <laughs> How did you become a conservative? <laughs> um, well, I have a kind of a split family. You know, mom's a little more liberal, dad's conservative. Um, they're, they're not together since I was young. And um, so, you know, I kind of, listen to both sides of the spectrum a little and, and I decided for myself, but I will tell you this, that there's a story and it came to me when I was first running, I had forgotten about it because I've been pretty conservative as long as I can remember. Um, but, you know, a lot more so as I got older and started to seek and learn for myself. But when I was in the third grade, uh, I ran for office for student council elections. And the way that it worked at my school is in third grade, you could run for treasurer or secretary. In fourth grade, you could run for vice president. In fifth grade, you could be president. But you, you know, you couldn't, if you were third grade, you could run for president. So I really, you know, I wanted to be president one day because he got all the perks, you know, he could, you know, walk around and he was just like, it was just cool. Leadership was just really cool to me. Um, so in third grade, I ran for secretary, no, treasurer. I ran for treasurer and I won. I had really great marketing. My mom made all my, my buttons and my posters and everything. And I loved people. I always loved people. So in third grade, I won. Fourth grade, I won by a landslide. In fifth grade, I was like ready to go. It's going to be the year I was going to run for president. And this girl who I had beat the prior two years, her name was Sarah Williams. She proposed a bill to the student council president that if you had won office the previous year, you could not run the following year. And I was like, there's no way the teacher is going to let this fly. Like, there's just no way. And he presents it on a vote for everybody to vote for it. And so everybody put their heads down and put their arms up and, you know, whether or not the, the bill would pass. And I looked up as everybody's voting and like everyone throws their hands up to pass it. And so the bill went into effect and I couldn't run for president at that time. And so I always say that's when I became a constitutional Republican because it was like, you see so many politicians, they, if they can't win, they change the rules. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so from there, I think, you know, when I just saw unfairness, you know, it's like from there, I just, I've always been one for justice. I've always been one for what's right. And Winston Churchill said it best. He sums it up. And he says, if you're not a liberal by the time you're 20, you don't have a heart. If you're not conservative by the time you're 40, you don't have a brain. 
And a lot of issues sound great. And I think, like you said earlier, we agree on a lot of things, liberal, conservatives. In the end, we want people to be taken care of. We want people to have access to affordable health care. We want people to be able to protect their homes. We want people to feel safe. We want people to be able to you know, be prosperous and pay for everything and pay for their future and pay for retirement and you know, have good, solid, stress-free lives. We all want that. But it's in how do you accomplish that? And the liberal narrative is while a lot, you know, the younger liberals, they have a good, their heart is in the right place. They don't understand the economic effect of, for instance, free healthcare for everybody. It's not free, you know, right. if somebody has to pay for it or um, removing your second amendment rights, you know? Yeah. Well, Things I don't like agree with that, that, that second amendment stuff. Uh, I, I think that's, that's insane. I think you should be free to buy as many guns as you want. Uh, we just need to worry about, I think the more, as a person that works in the schools, I think we need to more and more about mental health. Uh, you have to look at the family life of the student. And we yeah. saw that that was what happened in Parkland. Uh, the parents, and even in Newtown, the parents didn't know what the hell was going on with their kids. And they were playing video games all day. And, you know, you can't blame that on the gun. You've got to blame that on the parents and also whoever else is around these kids because apparently they're not living a good family life. Now, I do feel sorry uh, for a lot of these kids, Jesse, that grow up in tough homes. We, you know, see inner city Chicago, which is a gun, you know, fiesta over there where people are killing people. But I don't believe that it's taken away the guns. I think we need to make jobs over there and that will get rid of, the crime that's going on. It's got nothing to do with yeah. guns. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. I mean, even that can even translate to uh, documentation of immigrants. When people mm -hmm. are undocumented and they come over to the U.S., they're not protected by labor laws, and it's also difficult for them to get an honest paying job. So they're going to be mm -hmm. exploited and not paid proper wages, and they're not protected. They can't go report to authorities because they're going to be scared of prosecution or deportation. Um, but they got to feed their family still. So what do you expect? You know, any, it, you know, honestly, any human, if, if it is choosing, you know, break the law or feed your children, which one are you going to do? Um, so again, it's, you know, it's just um, making sure that people are prosperous enough so they don't turn to other things because that causes a lot of issues, you know, when the government taxes us to death, you know, and then parents have to go out and get second jobs. And then who's, like you said, who's taking care of their children at home? Then their children are raising themselves. And then their children are looking for ways to feel belonging and comfort. And they're looking in the wrong places or they start using, you know, substances. And um, I, I completely agree with you. And, and that just comes down to, you know, what is going to achieve, um, you know, what we want. And and it's, you know, it's it's, it's helping people to be, free and, and to take more of their money home so they can spend more time with their children and they don't have to work as hard and stress as much and um you know like you said i, I completely agree with you there uh, jesse i want to talk about this what issues are you hearing from voters on the ground well obviously you're not doing campaign events because of the uh pandemic right now but when you were campaigning and talking to a lot of voters what did you hear from them it's really interesting. You hear totally different things from person to person. You know, so many people are motivated by different things and uh, different things are important to them. In the conservative movement, uh, I hear a lot of people that really, really, really care about protecting life and, you know, that are pro-life. Um, the Second Amendment, you know, those people who are fighting for the Second Amendment and understand what it is and what it would mean to lose it, um, those are die hard you know, <laughs> like they, they're, they're diehard, you know, in it to win it. Um, you know, term limits, like you mentioned, overspending, uh, Congress overspending and needing to balance the budget is a big one and environmental issues as well. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that I think, you know, has people have tried to make it a partisan issue. And it's interesting, people will try to put you in a box. They'll go, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I'm like, listen, I'm an American. Okay, I'm an American. I'm running on the Republican ticket because you have to. You, if you run as an independent, you're going to lose. That's it. So I'm running as a Republican because those values most closely represent what I believe in. And 
in running as a Republican, you know which way I'm going to vote on almost every single issue. So I'm just being honest and transparent. However, the Republican establishment is, you know, not <laughs> representative of my beliefs as a conservative. So, um, so, you know, just a lot of people are just sick of career politicians. You know, it's not Republicans against Democrats. It's career politicians against the American people. And um, so, you know, those are a lot of issues, school choice, education. I mean, people just, everybody has, but you know what, probably more than anything, people just want transparency. People just want real, like just yeah. be real, you know? I hear you, I agree. <laughs> Somebody that's a Christian and not Jewish, and Ted Deutsch is, is Jewish, do you feel like that's going to be an obstacle in the campaign to get people that are uh, Jewish to vote for you? Well, I think you have, you have Judaism as a practicing belief system and a faith, and then you have it as just, I'm Jewish because my mom's Jewish, or it's, a, it's you know, right. in, like an ethnic group, uh, which is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think a lot of people who are practicing Jews have, have witnessed his actions. I mean, Ted Deutsch, he, he goes, okay, I'm Jewish but he has done nothing to stand up for Israel. He goes, we're gonna stand against anti-Semitism and he takes a picture with some Jewish people. Like that's, we're gonna, we're gonna take a stand against da 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 and he takes a picture of a bunch of kids at the Boys and Girls Club. Like, you know what? These kids don't need you to go drop off books at the Boys and Girls Club, they need a parent. They need somebody to show them how to achieve the American dream like you did for yourself. They don't need you going over and using them as pawns to pander with. And I think a lot of the Jewish community has seen that he's been using them as a tool to pander to, like, oh, I'm Jewish, vote for me. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go do that with Christians, you know? Like, right. I, you know, I follow Jesus, but, um, you know, if I'm not the candidate for you, I'm not the candidate for you. And if I am, then go to votejesse.com and make a donation, <laughs> you know? So I think he just, um, you know, he didn't, he condemned the, the assassination of Soleimani, um, al-Baghdadi, uh, when Ilhan Omar came out with her anti-Semitic remarks and, you know, I mean, Omar and Tlaib want to see Israel just completely demolished in the sea. And she sits on, Omar sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee with him. And when he was asked in a live interview about should she step down and remove, he kept jumping, he refused to answer the question. We must condemn, we must collectively condemn anti-Semitism. What does that mean? What does that mean? Like, what's the action? You know, we're just going to say, like, we shouldn't be anti-Semitic and go take a picture with a Jewish person. Like, you know what I mean? Are you actually going to fight for Israel? Are you actually going to go fight for, you know, tax breaks? Because a lot of Jewish people are entrepreneurs. They're very yeah. smart. You know, they, they open, they, they own their own businesses and he's out here calling for taxes on everybody and carbon taxes and all this stuff in the name of climate change and, mm -hmm. you know, pipes bursting in Fort Lauderdale, sewage pipes, and he's blaming it on climate change. It's like, you know, Jewish people care about clean waterways. Uh, mm -hmm. Jewish people don't want to be taxed to death to the point to their, where they can't, you know, stand to be in business anymore. They make up most of the entrepreneurs in Boca. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of them have woken up, but then you have some people that they've just, they've grabbed onto being a Democrat and mm -hmm. as their mom was or their dad was, and they, they wear it in their, in their identity and that's it. Like they don't want to have a conversation past, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'm a lifelong Democrat. And there are Republicans like that too. And that's the vote that, you know, I just kind of have to go, all right, well, I'm not your candidate. I'm not going to waste time on it, you know? So what is your platform? You talked about some of the things I'm sure as we've been talking about other issues. Um, well, you know, I would say four things kind of stand out. You know, the first one, a lot of the issues you and I have been talking about, like parentlessness, um, you know, just lack of direction um, we've got to reinstall god first whether you know there's judeo-christian values need to be reinstalled back into our schools back into we, we got to stop being scared of having righteous values so part of it is just being a leader that says no this is a nation that puts god first we don't worship government here and uh, we are free we are free from tyranny um, so i think putting god first and being an example of that and being an unapologetic example of that is important. Um, the Second Amendment is very important to me because that one protects all the others, whether people understand why it was implemented in the first place or not. The Second Amendment actually 
in the beginning when America was initially being founded, uh, the, the people were reluctant to support a standing army, an American military that would protect us against foreign threats, because we had just acquired a lot of land and people were after us. The French were after us, the British were after us, the Spanish were after us. A lot of people were after our land and we needed a standing military, but the people were like, well, if we have a standing military that's strong enough to defend us against all these other nations, then they're strong enough to you know, take tyranny over us all over again and take control of the people. So they, but they needed that protection. So that's when the compromise was made. Okay, well then the people have a right to a well-regulated militia to protect them against tyranny. And that's why the second amendment was initially installed. Um, so that one is like, you know, the second amendment protects all the others. And so second amendment, we shouldn't even be having discussions about infringing upon second amendment rights. Um, and so we need to go on the offensive and stop trying to, you know, allow ourselves to be backed into a corner and take blows in the face over the second. Um, we need to go on the offensive. The third one, term limits, like, like we were saying earlier, career politicians have become more dependent on the government than all these entitlement programs that they promote. They want people dependent on them because that's how they protect their little piece of power and their gravy train. Um, so term limits are huge. And then balancing the budget. Um, you know, a lot of people don't, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she said that. Um, but the IRS is actually unconstitutional. Payroll tax wasn't a thing until the early 1900s. And then people are like, well, you have to fund, you know, social programs and infrastructure. Yes, you do. But part of that is done by the private sector because they do a better job of it. And then the other part of it is like China, for instance, um, we're not supposed to be taxing our people in order to fund our infrastructure. Because we have low tax principles, people can grow their businesses, hire more people, take more home. And so that's how we became the most prosperous nation in the world. We do have the highest consumption rate in the world. So other countries wanna do business with us because of the way that we put our people first, not government first. So they wanna come and do business with us. So if China wants to come and sell all of their products, then they need to treat their workers properly and then they need to pay taxes to us if they want to ex exploit our people and you know sell things to them then china can pay a tax for selling to us or you know any other country that wants to do business with us they can pay a tax and then that's how you fund your infrastructure not by taxing the business owner and then taxing the employee again on their pay um, so those are probably you know four four really big issues um, and then one now more than ever one bill one issue. That's it. One bill gets passed. It's got one issue in it. Not the COVID stimulus and then museums, the Kennedy Center, and illegal immigrants, and all this other sitting there like, and Americans are still waiting for their checks right now, you know? Well, what about the Me Too movement, Jesse? All these people, Ashley Judd and all these other people saying, believe woman, believe woman. They made, did the big thing about Kavanaugh. Now, I'm not saying I believe Kavanaugh or not, but they made all this big hoo-ha about Kavanaugh did this to all rape this girl, this woman rather. And then when Joe Biden has all these women coming out saying something, and he has Tara Reid who came out and said that he basically... I can't say that word, but he put his fingers down where they're where it's supposed to be. Uh, yeah. In general, uh, yeah. the New York Times, if that doesn't comes out and they're like, oh, well, maybe we don't know. And all these Democratic politicians say that's not true. But if Trump did or somebody else did it, there would have been a 10 page article on starting from the front page of the New York Times to the Washington Post in general. And it's a, it's a total joke. So one yeah. person does like something good. You know? Yeah, like you said, it's like, do you really care about these women? And I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, both sides, both political ideologies are guilty a lot of times yeah. of being inappropriate with not being able to restrain themselves or control themselves around a woman, you know? I mean, it really takes a strong man of righteous values to be completely and utterly respectful around women see them for what they can add intellectually and business-wise and not see them as an object you know um it really does take a strong a strong man to do that but like it does it has to be if it's good for the goose it's good for the gander if right. if you're gonna you know research something and drag you know brett kavanaugh and his family through hell you know then why aren't you doing it with by with this woman with biden i mean 
what's her face that accused Kavanaugh had no specific recollection, nothing that he's, you know, that he did even remotely close to what Biden supposedly did to Tara Reid. She had specific, specific instances, specific times where she had reported an issue and nothing had been done about it and it was shuffled down, you know, like as a woman, her story sounds legitimate, you know, and you know, the, the one with Kavanaugh, they're just, it was, it was too convenient, you know, yeah. it was just too convenient. What is your take on Russia Gate? Uh, the Russian collusion? You know what? This is this is in a nutshell. Ukraine, Russia, uh, everything. The Democrat Party. If you want to know what they're doing, just look at whatever they're accusing their opponent of doing. They tell on themselves every single time. It was the dumb. First of all, first of all. If exposing, even if that had been done, even if it was the Trump administration that had done something, which it wasn't, it's been proven that it wasn't, and the FISA was a bunch of bullshit, but even if something was revealed about Nancy, Pol or I'm sorry, Hillary Clinton rather, if something had been revealed about Hillary Clinton and then voters heard about it and then they acted accordingly, that is not election interference. Okay, we are perfectly capable of thinking for ourselves. If somebody gives us information, then we can sit back and we can say, all right, well, I don't want to vote for somebody who did that, or I still want to vote for her. I don't care that she did that, which is what's going to happen anyway. So that's not, that's not collusion. But yeah, I mean, I think whatever they're accusing the other side of doing is usually what they're doing. And the Russian collusion thing was the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard of. It's so insulting to the intelligence of people who, and we don't care, but like, to people who have supported the president and saw him as you know a um you know a leader worth following that people try to say that we can't think for ourselves you know like that whole thing is premised on the fact that we couldn't make a decision on our own to vote for the president you know no we had already decided we supported him long before that and then time revealed exactly how dirty the corruption was and what the democrats were doing in order to you know find a way to impeach him but they're just uh they're just deranged man i mean i'm telling you the truth makes makes people do really crazy things it exposes people well jesse it's not even just that you look at the russia gate and what happened and they blame the election interference saying uh, all this stuff with the troll farms half of the memes that they came out and said that we're you know making sure people voted for trump Half of those came out after the election. And not even just that, Russia, they spent $100,000. Hillary Clinton had a $2 billion campaign chest. And you're telling me $100,000 is going to uh, transform election uh, voting, rather, transform voting in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania? Give me a break. I mean, it's a total joke. And not even just that. How about this with the Uranium One deal? She was colluding with Russia. They're telling, oh, vote blue no matter who. No, I'm not going to vote blue no matter who. <laughs> <laughs> Give me, tell Joe Biden to come out and say what policies he's for and not just say I'm going to bring back normalcy and bring back Barack Obama. I don't want Barack Obama again. We had Barack Obama for eight years. He didn't do a damn thing for me. And it's, it's just a total joke. Uh, to go on to the impeachment and hear what you said about that, I mean, it's like the Democrats keep making mistake after mistake. First, we just, as we spoke about with the Russia gate, and now we go to impeachment with Biden's son. Nobody talks about this and, except if you're in conservative media, but not in the liberal media. They don't talk about Biden's son making $50,000 a month. And then he, he didn't know anything about oil, but he goes over to Ukraine, makes $50,000 a month, and then they see all this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. 80,000. 80. I'm sorry. Even more. <laughs> so that's even worse. Yeah. And he doesn't know anything. So it's a total jump. So we're going to impeach Trump for bringing out that information. I don't think that's a big deal to me. I think if you're trying to win, you get all the information on the person you're going to run against and let the people decide whether it's worth it or not. If I'm a regular person, Democrat or Republican, $80,000 for, you know, working for a company that I know nothing about, I think there's a little bit of corruption going on when Joe Biden is dealing is with Ukraine and his son is getting paid off. And so it's a payoff. It's a quid pro quo. And then they go after Trump for his business deals, which 
you know, I think I believe that there was some shady stuff with the business deals. But you, as you said, the goose and the gander. You can't say Joe Biden's innocent and then go after Donald Trump. It's a joke. Yeah, I mean, the thing that, that people don't realize is that um, regardless of whether Joe Biden was running against the president now, first of all, the president knows Biden's not a formidable opponent, and he's always known that. Yeah. So why would he put his entire presidency and all that the American people are counting on him for on the line over Joe Biden? Come on, you know, first of all. Second of all, whether Joe Biden was running for election or not, that needs to be looked into. I don't give a damn if Joe Biden is run for president. That doesn't suddenly preclude him from being able to be investigated for corruption and stealing from us, stealing from you, stealing from me. That is not okay. You know, like you, you can't filter money. And then Joe Biden's on camera bragging about it. He can't help himself. Like I said, he sniffs women on camera, touches them inappropriately on camera, on public television. And he was also on public television in front of everyone sitting there with his legs crossed all cocky saying, hey, yeah, I went to Ukraine for the 13th time and I told them if they don't, they're, if they don't fire that special prosecutor, they're not getting a billion dollars. And they told me, well, you can't do that. And I, that's the president's authority. And, and Joe Biden's like, well, call him, call him, call Obama then. And he's like, and I'll be damned if he wasn't fired right away. Like, I mean, the guy's bragging about it. He admitted to it on national television, you know? And, and then they go and say, oh, how dare the president tell Ukraine who has a history of corruption and stealing money from us. Like, listen, we're, you know, the guy who ran for president in Ukraine this time around campaigned on doing away with the corruption. That was his platform. <clears throat> so the president said to him, do what you said you're going to do. Make good on your promises, you know, right. into the corruption. Because there's plenty. It's not just Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. There's a heck of a lot more there. And he said, go look into it before I go take money from all of my people who are working hard trying to take care of their families and go give it to you just to filter into, you know, somebody's bank account like Hunter Biden. What do you think they should have did with the stimulus? And are you happy with what they did do? No, and I think that, you know, like we're talking about the election in November, I think the real wake-up call is going to be a lot of these career politicians trying to stuff work into the stimulus, um, and, and they pissed off a lot of Americans who were dealing with real-life situations during this loss of income, loss of jobs, double lost income, kids home, no child care. I mean, serious, serious issues that have been caused by shutting down the economy irresponsibly. I don't believe in the shutdown to begin with. I think we could have been a lot smarter about that. I think quarantining should have been an optional for those who felt like they wanted to be protected from it. And then there are a lot of people who weren't scared of it. They're like, I'm going to take care of my immune system and I'm going to keep working and making sure my family's taken care of and I'm not scared. Like I don't operate based off of fear and hysteria. So I think that should have never happened in the first place. Um, but a lot of people trying to play politics and please everybody. Um, but, you know, the other thing is just, it was such a waste. If you look at everything that was stuffed into that bill, uh, $2 trillion into the CARES Act, it was not the appropriate time for that. And the American people are pissed. I'm pissed. And a lot of people are pissed off. I don't get a $1,200 check. I don't. I'm, yeah. I'm just over the, the threshold of threshold, the dollars yeah. because of what I did in 2018. But this year, I'm running for office to serve my country. So I'm not making that money, you yeah. know, and I don't get it. But I'm going to pay for it in taxes, you know, and I'm also going to pay 300 million to illegal immigrants that was in there. We're also going to pay 25 million for the Kennedy Center who laid people off and they just wanted to get a facelift. Another one point some odd billion for museums, you know, like, Really? This is what we were focused on. And now the money for small businesses has run out. And, and now there, there are uh, McConnell and some others are trying to bring added funding to replenish the funding that's gone for small businesses because it was depleted so quickly. And Democrats are again trying to throw stuff into it. Like this is not a time for special interests. You know, so um, I'm just, I'm really, really fired up. And I think a lot of people are really upset about um, the way that that was handled. That was, if, if nothing else showed people the Democrat Party's true colors right now, and some Republicans too. I'm not going to, you know, it's not just a partisan issue. If, if that didn't wake people up to the fact that they don't give a damn about working Americans, they only care about themselves, then I don't know what will, you know. 
The Republicans are more of the workers party where the Democrats are more of the Silicon Valley Wall Street party, which it used to be the difference. What is your take on that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that it's just coming more to light um, a little bit. Again, you know, the issue is when you start trying to put people in a partisan box. And that's where the issue has been. It's Democrats and Republicans. And all these issues are Democrats and all these issues are Republicans. And then you classify them and you label them instead of realizing that there are people shouldn't fit into a box. And if they do, then there's a serious issue. That person doesn't have the ability to free think or formulate their own values and then go based off of that they just go party line and um and so i think that you just are finding that over time you know certain ideologies have just like kind of eased over into their lanes you know because like people like me i have to, like i told you i have to pick a side i can't run as an independent and but conservative values you know generally speaking are for the people they really are in in application you know when you actually carry out those processes you achieve prosperity for the american people and democrat values are more emotion based and this sounds really good but you have no idea what it's going to cost you and how much it's going to cost you so um so i think that uh the you know again it's just it's just different people and a lot more of them they they have really drifted over to the republican side because those are the effective values and you you know they are that they are for the working people you know right. oh, in a pandemic do you believe that we need medicare for all well i don't medicare for all that that concept to me is it's not a real concept um it's not free health care for all i believe affordable you know, affordable for everyone is a different thing. So mm -hmm. the thing is that you, there are issues in the healthcare system that have driven costs up at astronomically. I mean, for my son and me, if I told you how much health insurance is for us a month, you would fall out of your chair. And I'm a single mother, you know, yeah, and, and this is the thing. I take very good care of myself. I don't use it. Yeah. I don't use it at all Dang, and, yeah. and I get killed on health insurance, you know? So I think that, um, you know, the first thing that needs to happen, it, if, if you allow the market to operate properly, it will get to a point where everybody will be insured. The people that genuinely can't afford it will get health care, and then the people that can afford it and want to choose a different type of plan that's maybe a different quality, gives them more flexibility and choice with their doctors, they can afford that. But the first thing you have to do is make it more competitive. Health insurance companies need to compete against each other for our business, and they're not doing that right now. One of the issues is state lines. You can't sell across state lines. So they give certain states, like it gives companies monopolies within the state. So then it's super duper duper expensive for middle-class Americans to, to cover their family, you know? And then the other thing is that shared interest groups, like, you know, a temple, a Christian group, or, you know, a teacher's group or whatever, people can join together. They should be able to join together to get the same discounts that corporations get you know, if you work for a large corporation, because not everybody, like there are a lot of small business owners, they, you know, they don't qualify for some sort of, they don't get some sort of corporate discount where their company pays a significant part of their health insurance because the company gets a discount. Um, so there should be a, another way for them to join together and leverage their purchasing power in order to do that. So I just think it, it's, it's the system that's broken that will achieve everybody being insured. Everybody who is an American citizen being insured, you know, there's a way to achieve that. Um, and so I think that we have the same value on people should have access to medical treatment if they're injured or they need it, you know, regardless of their socioeconomic status, they should, but we've got to clean up all the crap in the middle that's making it so expensive. You got to treat the root cause of the problem, not just go try and, you know, treat the symptoms, you know, and go call the issues. To go back with that, uh, we hear a lot of senior citizens that are really happy with their Medicare. And when any politician says they're going to cut things and they start saying they're going to cut Medicare or Social Security, I know Social Security isn't healthcare, but in general, senior citizens get really upset. So with Medicare for all, 
the concept is somewhat the same as, you know, it's Medicare. It's just for everybody. Obviously, it would have a different price tag of stuff. So what would you say to something like that where, you know, we see all these senior citizens that are happy with their Medicare? Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's, it's freedom. If you want that type of insurance, okay. If you want something different because it, it fits you differently, like I have really terrible allergies and it impacts my respiratory system. And like, you know, if I don't take allergy medicine every single day. So for me, you know, that's one thing that would be great just if I just had that covered. It's not expensive, you know, for me to go buy it over the counter. And half the time I'm paying the insurance and I go buy it over the counter anyway because I don't have time to go get a renewed prescription. Um, so I just, I like the thought of free choice. If you want to go get a different type of plan that suits your needs better than government, you know, chosen, then you should be able to do that, you know? And I, I just don't believe in the government doing a good job at anything. Like by nature, it just gets too big, inefficient, out of touch, slow, low quality. And then you start dictating how much doctors are allowed to charge for their services. And then doctors say, well, to hell with it. I'm not going to go to school and pay half a million dollars to come out and the government tells me what my time is worth, what, you know, 12 years of my life were worth in education. And I got half a million dollars worth of yeah. debt. You know, like you, and then you lose good doctors and then the quality of healthcare drops, you know? So it's, it's like, yeah, you know, again, I would love to see everyone insured, but it's just gotta be effective. That's it. You know, it's what advice would you give young people that want to run for office? Obviously you're 32. We have people that listen in that are in their twenties and thirties, are mostly millennials, college kids uh, that are in college right now. What would you tell them? I would say, um, do it. If it's, if it's in your heart, you know, really take some time and ask yourself why you're doing it. And, you know, are you do if you're doing it for the right reasons, if you're doing it to make a difference in your country, then do it. If you're doing it just to elevate yourself and just to get attention, then don't, you know, you just really search your heart and see what you're in it for. And if, and if you feel like that's your calling and that you can make a difference, then don't hesitate. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to have a lot more voices trying to tell you it can't be done than ones that will tell you that it can. And that's where you have to make sure you have the right voices around you and you cut out all the negatives so that you can stay focused and plow forward. And then the other thing is, you know, if you want to not just, you know, jump into it head first, um, then, you know, go work on a, a campaign and, and kind of just, you know, if you want to run for congressional office or whatever, or state rep, go work on a campaign, go volunteer, go help and pay attention. Okay. How are they doing? What's successful? What's working out? What blew up in their face? You know, cause it's a lot of, you know, falling down, skinning your knees up, standing back up and going, okay, that wasn't a good move or that, you know, that vendor was trying to take advantage. And so now I have to find another vendor, you know, so, you know, maybe establish your network first and then, and then go for it. And remember it's service. It's not, right. it's not, it's not a walk in the park. It's tough, you know? <laughs> so. I, I can understand. Uh, lastly, Jesse, where can people find more about you and help you out? What do you need the most from people right now in this time? VoteJesse.com, J-E-S-S-I, VoteJesse.com. Uh, I definitely need donations, you know, like we were just talking about, you know, it's not fun to ask for them, but I don't get any benefit out of this. You want to reach the district, then you've got to send mailers out to 500,000 people. You know, that costs money. Yard signs cost money. Hiring digital firms to, you know, put together all your graphics and put all that out, that costs money. Um, so, you know, campaigns need money and these career politicians have a lot of it. That's the problem. They're so entrenched. They have a ton of money. And it doesn't mean you can't, you can't beat them with a portion of what they've got um but you know it we can't do it by ourselves and five dollars helps one dollar helps you know all at a minimum even one dollar it says you know what you've got my vote you've got my support it sends that message um and then you know share on social media i'm on facebook jesse for us congress or jesse melton for us congress um twitter is vote jesse 2020 and instagram is jesse melt so any of my stuff um, share it, please, and um, feel free to create graphics and run it by me. And if you want to volunteer with digital stuff, please feel free to do that. And, um, and that's it. Anyway, Jesse, thanks so much for coming on the program. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me.